We're here with some uh, community leaders to discuss um, <clears throat> what they perceive as uh, federal loopholes and background checks for gun purchases. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, introducing uh, Jenny Charles here to my right. She's a Nashville attorney, a mom, and a victim of gun crime. Uh, to her right, uh, Judge Alberto Gonzalez, former U.S. Attorney General and now a Nashville attorney and a Belmont professor. Uh, to his right, Father Joseph Breen, pastor of St. Edward Church and School here in Nashville. So we'd like to start with Jenny, and I think uh, everybody would like to talk, make a few comments, and then we'll have questions and answers. Well, we're here today to talk about the loophole that currently exists at gun shows uh, with commercial sales of firearms. And as all of you know, Tennessee was ranked by the FBI as the most violent state. Um, and most of Tennessee's violent streak comes from its metropolitan areas, Memphis being the fifth most dangerous city in the United States and Nashville being the 18th most violent city in the United States. So gun violence and gun crimes are a growing problem. We feel that closing this loophole would keep firearms out of three classes of people. That, are, that is, people who are mentally ill, those who have already been processed through the criminal justice system and are felons, and also domestic abusers. We believe that these common sense background checks on all commercial gun, sa on all commercial gun sales would stop much of the violence that's going on in our community. Now, as a victim of gun violence myself, I've experienced this. When I was 16 years old, I was working at a Brentwood Baskin Robbins, and someone came in and held my coworker and myself at gunpoint and then put us in the ice cream freezer uh, where a customer later found us. Well, being a victim of gun violence doesn't make me an expert in gun crime. It did uh, spark a curiosity in how these individuals are getting these types of guns. And as a mom and a citizen, I'm very concerned about this. And I'm concerned about how it touches certain segments of the population, for example, law enforcement. Um, on April 1st, 2011, Chattanooga Police Sergeant Tim Chapin was killed after a felon, Jesse Matthews, obtained a gun from a private seller. This private seller had done so many gun transactions that federal law enforcement officials had told him that he needs to obtain a federal license to sell guns. However, he kept selling guns, he kept trading guns, and he kept going to gun shows to do these transactions. The ATF later sent in an undercover agent, and he told this undercover agent he had a buyer in Nashville who purchased numerous guns from him at gun shows and wanted a Thompson submarine gun, a Thompson submachine gun, which was a fully automatic weapon. Again, domestic violence victims, this issue touches their lives as well. In the 1990s, after his home was burglarized, an individual by the name of Adrian Gilliam bought a 9mm gun from a private seller. It just happened that Adrian Gilliam was a convicted murderer and a convicted armed robber out of Florida. Of course, when a private seller sells a gun to a person, they don't have to run a background check. So this information wasn't available to the private seller. Adrian Gilliam went on on July 2nd, 2009 to sell a gun, that particular gun, to a 20-year-old by the name of Sahel Kazimi outside of David Buster's for $100. And as everyone knows, that gun was later used to kill Steve McNair. So we have two private purchases of the same weapon, uh, no background checks. At the end of last year, federal authorities brought charges against two Nashville residents for going to gun shows and purchasing firearms and then secreting those firearms in, um, actually, uh, they secreted them in engine blocks and sent those to Australia where they were used in crimes. Federal authorities later arrested two Lebanese na uh, nationals from Australia who were coming to Nashville with large amounts of cash and purchasing these weapons at gun shows without background checks or through straw purchasers. Lastly, Channel 5 News this year did a story about Jonathan Gutierrez, a notorious Brown Pride member. They interviewed Mr. Gutierrez from the Northwest uh, Correctional Complex run by the Tennessee Department of Corrections 
where he bragged that he and his Brown Pride gang members would go to gun shows purchasing large amounts of weapons and not going through background checks. Um, he recommended it in his interview to others to go to these background checks where you are, excuse me, to go to these gun shows in Nashville where you could purchase these guns without background checks. A lot of criticism is leveled um, at this movement because they state that, well, it's too onerous to make a private purchaser, uh, a prospective private purchaser, go to great lengths to go to a background or, or to travel maybe to go uh, to a federally licensed firearms dealer with their uh, seller of the firearm and get a background check. But in fact, 99.6% of people in Tennessee live within 10 miles of a gun dealer. And that figure comes from Mayors Against Illegal Drugs. And this figure came from Michael Knight, who is a special agent and uh, public information officer at the Maryland Farms ATF. There are over 4,000 federally licensed gun dealers in the state of Tennessee alone. How many? 4,000, approximately 4,000. And so we're all here in support of this and to me, it's, it's common sense. Well, when I worked up in Washington, uh, we obviously had a number of conversations with our, uh, my Mexican counterpart uh, about drug uh, violence, uh, about the violence generally on, on the border. And every time we raise the issue about, okay, you've got to deal, do you have to deal with, with these drug traffickers, the Mexican authorities would say, well, you need to deal with the guns coming over into this country illegally, particularly guns being sold at, at uh, gun shows along our southern border. As a result of those discussions, um, we began the process under President Bush's direction to look at closing the gun show loophole. And that's when I really became sort of aware of this problem. And uh, after months of study and discussions, ultimately we decided that that's, this was something that politically quite honestly, could not be done at the time. Nonetheless, um, having looked at this back then and looking at it today, it, it seems to me to be just a common sense approach to dealing with gun violence. We, we have a serious problem with gun violence in this country, and I'm not suggesting that by closing the gun show loophole, we're going to address all of the gun violence. That's certainly not true. Nor am I suggesting that by, clo by um, closing the gun show loophole, bad guys, people who are intent on get, gathering weapons, will not be able to get to, to obtain um, weapons. If someone really wants to obtain a weapon, they can do so in our country, simply because we have a, a very strong Second Amendment that exists today. Nonetheless, that should not deter us from taking steps that make common sense, uh, uh, a, a common sense approach to, um, to, to addressing gun violence in this country. I understand the argument about uh, this is an infringement upon the Second Amendment, you know, um, with rights come responsibilities, and no right is absolute. The Supreme Court has already said that reasonable restrictions can be imposed by the government with respect to gun ownership. This is a, a common sense approach that, we, that already applies to 60 percent of the guns transactions in this country, and, and I have no problem at all, and there's certainly not a constitutional issue, issue as far as I'm concerned in expanding the number of transactions that should be, should be subject to, uh, to background checks. I agree with those who, who, do not, who believe that uh, certain kinds of transactions, particularly between family and friends, private sales, uh, should not be subject to background checks for a number of reasons. But there are a number of commercial transactions that I think uh, could go a long way. Now, obviously, doing so means or requ requires that we have a, a database that's complete and accurate. And there we still have some challenges with states in terms of providing background information, information re regarding mental illness of, of residents in those states. So we've got to do a better job of encouraging states to come forward and present information into the national database. But once we do that, we make progress there, uh, it seems to me that this is a common sense approach that, that all of us uh, should, should support. Bob? Shortly after the uh, tragedy in Connecticut, we had a petition drive at our church, St. Edward's, and the main focus was to ban assault weapons. Uh, we have over, we had over 1,200 
adults to sign that. But since then, I think it's more realistic and something that we should definitely do is to demand background checks on all, as you say, commercial business, transfer and selling the guns. <clears throat> I don't believe the politicians will have the courage, the leadership, to even demand background checks on all uh, commercial sellers. I think maybe there's a possibility. They do say that the majority of the members of the NRA are in favor of a background check, the majority members. If we could somehow have a some kind of program to encourage those members to let their views be known to the leaders. Uh, they're the most powerful group of all, and I imagine it's just a small group who certainly, uh, they're the lobbyists for the gun industry. So, I mean, they're looking out strictly for themselves financially, but if the members of the NRA who would support a background check would be encouraged uh, to let their leaders know how they feel. That would take some of the heat off the politicians. And I would hope that the leaders in the NRA, which I may not be very confident they would do it, but this is really in some ways I see as a moral issue. I really think that if we really care about America, care about life, we care to be responsible, I think those elements are necessary uh, for the good of all Americans, and that means that we should definitely have background checks for all gun sales. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, you yeah, how, how are you guys funded to, to do this? Where is your funding coming from? Frank, there really is no funding. Okay. This is a coalition of, okay. of, you know, of uh, leaders across the state who've come together and said, you know, it's time we got to address this in some sort of common sense way. Yeah, I want to know who's funding. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the church isn't paying for this? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask specifically, I see you have a handout about the, the mansion to the proposal. Um, are there other already introduced bits of legislation that you're uh, well, not sponsoring, obviously, but supporting? supporting? Um, Judge, I, I, I'll just say that, you know, Mansion to me was a, up for uh, significant debate and a vote earlier this year. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, not passed, and we suspect that at some point it will come, some new and improved version, maybe called something differently, but some piece of legislation will come back up. and so. We think it's important to you know, help educate and inform the public about the facts surrounding this issue so that when it does come back up for debate. And, and of course that bill is the one that so many uh, constituents in Tennessee were, you know, very loudly for or against the votes by Alexander and, and Bob Corker. So. They were both in opposition. Yeah. And I think it failed by what, one or two votes. I think the final vote was 54 to 46, and so that's hardly a shellacking. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, specific, I mean, it, most of the talk, the, most, most of what you've talked about is the gun show loophole. Um, and I believe that is also in the mansion, too, correct? Um, is there, are there any other um, approaches to that, that that you've seen anyone else coming at it because it seems like with the, the gun legislation there are always you know there are a lot of reversals and a lot of you know people coming and then they come back and bring it in a different way and I'm just wondering I'm not thinking primarily of I know tomorrow's the anniversary of Newtown uh, so there's a lot of uh, stories in the news about what, what, what is going on in different states right now. Uh, different states have adopted gun measures this year 
uh, since Newtown, and some of the, and for the most part, most of them have actually loosened gun restrictions, but some states are tight. And uh, and I wonder where you all, if you all had seen anything across that kind of landscape that would help help your cause. You think? Well, I think that since Newtown, um, the fight is on the local level. And uh, Tennessee is one of the most conservative states. Uh, we have um, some very lax gun laws here at the local level. Um, and as the two individuals uh, who were recalled in Colorado found out, if you oppose the NRA, um, it can be very dire to your career ambitions. Uh, but I think the, the fight now is more on the local level. Um, we have people all across the aisle, Republican and Democrats, supporting these measures. Most notably, Chris Christie in New Jersey. Uh, he instituted some, some very strict gun control measures. Um, but he also uh, did not go all the way. Um, he, there were some, I believe, that they were collector guns. Um, in fact, fully automatic guns, which he did not make illegal because he felt like they were more collector's pieces. And, and so I, I really think that in order to make this movement work, we're going to have to engage both sides of the aisle and, and do so in a respectful, civil manner instead of just talking past each other and, and what oftentimes, unfortunately, results in a screaming match. Uh, we're going to have to engage each other civilly. And, and are you engaging the... Uh more conservative members of the delegation um, uh, in Tennessee, or are you engaging uh, Lieutenant Governor Ramsey or Beth Harwell on these issues? Not directly, but this is part of the effort to, to um, inform and educate um, the leaders here in Tennessee that uh, there are some very strong views in favor of um, limiting gun violence. And, and there are many ways. You, you look at the at the bill that, that failed. I mean, there are many provisions that uh, may ultimately end up in a, a bill that could pass. Some provisions may, may fall out, but um, we're, we're hopeful that people will, will sit down and have a very honest debate. Uh, there's a, so much rhetoric out there, it's just untrue. It's all rhetoric, it's all noise. And uh, it does a disservice, quite frankly, to the citizens of Tennessee. And I, I get it. I'm from Texas. I understand the importance of gun, gun rights and the important people feel strongly about their guns. But they all feel, also feel strongly about the safety of individuals in the state. And we can have, we can have both. It was interesting that uh, earlier this week the, the, the law that, uh, about the plastic guns mm -hmm. um, that the NRA said that they were in support, supporting that, that law staying in place. And, you know, there's this sense of the impression that the NRA is unshakable about anything, but in that case, that seems like maybe a, a pivot point. But they're unshakable about adding a provision that, that uh, about, the metal piece. about the metal piece. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. But it, I, I'm wondering if there's if there's some some um, optimism there uh, for 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 talking. You know, like you say. More, more discussion for, for people who appear to have a hardened position on it. So, um, you know what your thoughts were. But, but it sounds like you're, well, you're saying because of that one point that, that it. But, but of course, we'll, we'll t we, we take the support of the NRA for common sense measures like outlawing plastic weapons, which is a no brainer. <laughs> So I'm not sure how much of a concession that is by the NRA, but of course we accept, we, we, we take that with yeah. appreciation. Yeah. Little steps at a time, something like that to follow up. And in a very, as you say, civil matter, you know, with the respect for those that you'll be working with, appeal to the leaders of the NRA and say, you know, this doesn't have anything to do with the Second Amendment, really. We're not talking about taking your guns away. We're just trying to make society safer. And as you say, have the background checked because there are going to be more and more mental cases that are going to, people are going to really inflict a lot of violence. I mean, when you have a school, we have 420 children. And no matter what kind of security we put in, 
somebody could come in any day and have another new town. And uh, we have to do something to make it a little bit safer. We're not going to make it totally safe. But uh, I really think the appeal to the leaders concerning this is a matter of morality. If you really care about your country, uh, have your guns, but definitely support a background check. And I'm going to, I've written and I've shared these views with both Senators Corker and Alexander. I've also written to the head of the uh, Catholic Bishops Conference, the head of Archbishop Cardinal of New York. He was replaced about two or three weeks ago. But uh, they've been quite strong. Maybe uh, more encouragement from him, the bishops, and consider it to be a more situation that is good for the whole nation. And I think you put the leaders of the NRA you know, in a better light. Does, does it, um, and, I, and, and if I'm straying off too far off the, the path, then correct me, but um, as, as a priest, um, and, and one of the main Catholic Church's missions is you know, helping the poor and so forth, um, it does seem like gun crimes, you know, I'm not talking about the mass killers, but just like what, what happened in your experience, those kind of crimes fall head more heavily on the poor. Um, you know, where is there is there is there an approach there toward some kind of answer uh, through through you know Catholic ministry to answer that? To to I mean I'm talking I'm talking to to political leaders as a, as a way to go about it. Is that is that an approach? As I say. Uh it would be nice if the head of many religions would unite and coordinate the efforts. I don't know whether, I'm not aware of any real effort on that part to get the major religions together and if they would work together and coordinate something of that nature, I think it would have a lot of power, a lot of influence. When you're suggesting that, I, I definitely intend to share that with Cardinal Dolan, whom I've communicated with several times, and I know him to a certain degree. We need more ec ecumenical uh, workings together for the common good, and I intend to follow through on that. If I could, if I could speak just a little bit about that, I think gun violence, especially in Nashville, has absolutely decimated the African American communities, especially in North and South Nashville. And with these mass shootings, um, especially at at schools that are suburban, um, largely upper middle class white communities, you're starting to see the kind of violence that's always been in the African community, African American community, creep into the suburbs, and it's it's woken a lot of people up that maybe weren't so interested in this issue before. And then the other thing that, and, and, and as the editorial page editor, I see a lot of, all, all the letters to the editor that we get. And we get a lot of letters about, about guns and gun rights and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> and as you said, this is a, state where people love their guns. Uh, so a lot of the time the tone is about why are you uh, wanting to change laws to punish me as a law-abiding gun owner? Because in our society all, all the rights that you enjoy are always going to be subject to some kind of regulation or control. The right to vote is fundamental. But yet, if you're a felon, you can't vote. If you don't register, you can't vote. So just because a right is fundamental doesn't mean it cannot be regulated in some way uh, for the good of the people. And 
that is certainly true with respect to ownership of guns. Um, we already have in place a scheme where over 60% of firearms transactions are subject to background checks. So all we're asking is that it be extended to additional transactions. People say, you know, it, it's not the gun, it's people killing people, not guns killing people. Well, let's run a background check on those people. And I, I would ask um, the individuals who are so fervently uh, against background checks, you know, the TSA regulates the no-fly list, and, and I heard this great analogy. And it said, would you want to get on an airplane, board an airplane, if the TSA was in charge of the no-fly list but didn't have the actual no-fly list? In other words, would you want to get on an airplane which a, a body, a government body, was in charge of regulating who got on it, and they weren't actually supplied the list? It's, it's analogous uh, to not running background checks. We, we entrust these private sellers to make sure that the person who they're selling to is not a felon, but we're not giving them any way to check who's actually a felon. The, absolutely what you say, I think the majority of Americans agree with you. The challenge is how do you create the pressure on uh, the legislators to to follow that, and I, I think that's the real, uh, I'm, I'm just curious about the strategies that you guys have to increase the pressure on legislators to uh, do the moral thing or do the rational thing or do the right thing. Well, we may not need to have a strategy, unfortunately, in that often. What I, my observation has been, you look at the history of this country, particularly with respect to action by Congress. Um, sometimes it takes a tragedy, it takes a scandal, it takes a national catastrophe before these kind of changes are responded to in Congress. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know how much more we need in terms of a, you know, a tragedy than what we've seen recently, but perhaps it's going to take another such mass shooting before the American people rise up and really put pressure on members of Congress to to do the sensible thing. It's not a fun strategy to rely on a tragedy, though. No, of course not. No, absolutely, absolutely. And um, and I wish we could, sitting here today, we, we could say we have the answer. We know how to get legislation passed in Congress. We know how tough it is. And uh, this is just part of us, uh, I guess, one step in, yeah. in trying to educate uh, sort of the people here in Tennessee about, about the importance of putting in place a, additional rational measures to minimize, we know we're not going to eliminate gun violence, but to minimize gun violence. Well, certainly within the House, the Tennessee delegation is probably the most conservative delegation in the House. And, um, <clears throat> so that would put you know, your, the, what you're trying to do um, as the most one of the most interesting challenges in the United States, if you can begin to break down that solid wall. So just very curious to see you guys and um, interested to watch you guys try to uh, uh, do that <laughs> to pull a brick out of that wall. <laughs> Sometimes it's I hard. I mean, if you pull I... a brick out of that wall, it will make the whole country stand up and notice that there's been a change in uh, thinking. That's why I. Uh, Maybe you can excommunicate. I'm a little bit more <laughs> negative about dealing with. Uh, Politicians. Well, Father, I'm realistic. Like I'm realistic about dealing with politicians. I, I get it. I know. Yeah, I don't think that uh, they have the courage or the ability to change. You had a very conservative, respected person in the state legislature. What was it? They uh, didn't want uh, Deborah Maggard. Yes. The guns and trucks. And only one thing that they didn't like, and they got rid of her. That's why I say I think maybe I'm a little bit negative about converting the politicians. But uh, if those members of the NRA would write and encourage the leaders of the NRA, which I intend to write personally, you know what the names are, one of them, some French fellow, 
<laughs> Wait, LaPierre. I really don't respect them enough to, to <laughs> try to remember their name. I'm but sure he, let I'm them sure know to meet you. that it doesn't have anything to do with the Second Amendment and that all we want is a background check for all the gun sales. Well, the chairman is of Tennessee. Pardon? The chairman of the NRA is of Tennessee. I don't know where, couldn't care less, but the point I want to make is that I don't think there's much hope to get the politicians changed their mind unless they have the permission of the leaders of the NRA. And I think that's <coughs> sad because I see it in another area. If they got you in their pocket when it comes to gun control, then in many ways they got you in whatever else they want to pass and that to me further corrupts the government. Where, where do you feel the, the gun manufacturers are exactly in all this? I mean, obviously there's been a lot of talk about that they're the ones who are really pulling the, spray, pulling the strings with... Sure, the they're paying the NRA offices. Yeah, so... I think the gun manufacturers are very happy about the debate because so long as there is ongoing debate, there is a possibility that the gun's going to be taken away, which means that people are going to go out and buy ammunition and guns now because mm -hmm. stock up. they're going to stock up. That so, doesn't sound realistic. That sounds cynical. Well, it's true. But it's true. It's true. Well, and, and the gun manufacturers, I don't know, even have to say a word in this debate. The NRA is out doing their bidding for yeah. them. I guess I thought about them this week, too, because... They probably don't make plastic guns, but if the NRA, if the NRA doesn't much care about the plastic guns. What I think is also inconsistent, whenever we hire anybody, we got to do a background check. And that's very good, so safety. And most of those people uh, are not going to be dangerous, they haven't been in trouble. But yet, somebody wants to buy a gun, especially an assault weapon, that has one purpose, to kill a lot of people in a short period of time. We don't demand background check. I mean, a total inconsistency. Of, I just think it's, it really is a, it takes away appreciation for our American people. I had never been on armslist.com, um, and I, I got on this website last night, and you can do a search by state, and, and these are just two that I found uh, listed in Tennessee that advertise, quote, I'm an individual, so there is no background check fee or tax. And one is a uh, 40 caliber handgun, and the other is a AR-15, both very blatant about no background check. In fact, they advertise it, and that's perfectly legal. Coming in, I think, on 65 from Franklin, there's a big billboard that tells you you can yeah. get any of those weapons you that's want. That's right. And we're talking about not handguns. We're talking about, I think they had machine guns and had about six or seven different categories of real assault weapons. And just so that it's clear, I don't have a problem with responsible individuals owning those kind of weapons if they want them. That's okay as far as I'm concerned. I don't know why they need them, but it, as far as I'm concerned, it's their right to do so. It's the people that are irresponsible or that are mentally ill or criminals. That's, that's what we should be concerned about. I think it's, the, the challenge is just how do you move from this place that we are today to the place where you want to, you, you think we should be, which, uh, you know, I say most Americans are in the same place that, that you are, and how do we? I think it's you know it's 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 great that we have uh, people willing to stand up and and speak out about it, but you know talking it has to lead to action. I mean, otherwise you guys wouldn't spend this time. You want to see action, um, and just <clears throat> the more we can understand about what your uh, strategies are to move from um, the sort of the moral and rational position to um, the action position. I, I think the, the, the more that we've got to write about, the more that we've got to keep this up in uh, 
people's consciousness. I mean, we, it, it, there's got there. The more things that happen, the more things there are to write about. I think you had an article in your paper. I'm pretty sure yesterday or day before, where the people in Connecticut are more organized now, and they. In that paper, I think it had 20 or 30 organizations that are gearing up to work together and get more voice, more power. I believe it was in the Tennessee. It was. It was and the, I mean, the challenge is, is as there as anywhere else. Uh, for the most part, though, um, there's a lot of concern and 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 uh, talk, and yet the regulations haven't changed. Things happen. Yeah, the rules. The, the the, the the rules to uh, regulate uh, the right so that it is a rational uh, right um, to have it happen. You know, I don't, and, I'm, and I hope I, I would want it not to be a tragedy that um, is the lever. Because in all honesty, I, I would um, say that when we see tragedy, um, as much as it galvanizes people for uh, uh, regulating the right. It also galvanizes people to say, from my cold, dead fingers, you'll pry that right from me. I mean, so it, it levers up the emotion on both sides. So it's when we're away from these tragedies to talk about what's the rational responsibility of citizens to um, manage their rights, where I think you had the best chance but uh, people lose sight of the fact, though, is we're not trying to take away your gun from your cold, dead hands. We simply want to make sure it doesn't get in the hands of people that shouldn't have them. If you're a responsible person, we're not talking about taking away your guns. The irony here is that what we're talking about, this position was actually the NRA's position in the late 90s. They were for very much for universal background checks to keep guns out of the hands of those who shouldn't have them. And public debate shifted, and I think our our goal, our strategy, is to try to help educate the public, inform folks exactly what we're talking about so that we can begin to shift that debate back, you know, and it may take a little time. It's kind of like the UT football coach, you know, brick by brick, but you've got to start somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I, the, when you when you shift it to which type of weapon it is, then you lose, you lose traction on the, the background check, because, I mean, a rifle is a rifle. Some of them look different. Right, and, and and personally, that's not what I'm here to advocate right. for. We're here for background checks. Right. Um, you've got these detachable components that go on a rifle, and, and I know Ted Cruz is fond of pointing out they're scary parts, um, but you're right. A rifle is a rifle at the end of the day. Um, and, and if we could just focus on background checks and, and keep all the red herring away, um, I think we can get somewhere. I, I would agree. I think that, that uh, the, all, the, all the noise uh, does, get in, in, does interfere with that, that one signal that, that I think is a rational argument. Do, do you all in, in the Tennesseans for Common Sense with background checks, is there a, do you have a voice from, say, the health, health community? As for the aspect of mental health, uh, you know, as being part of, I, I mean, I would think right now, I don't know if it's even covered under background checks. You know, there may be some some aspect of it, but, you know, that's one of the things they talked about after the, the biggest mass shootings is you can't, um, you can't know about someone's mental health history. You know, after, well, I'll just say that after the Virginia Tech shootings, I was part of a commission that George, uh, President Bush put together uh, with Mike Levitt, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and Margaret Spellings, the Education Secretary. And we visited various, uh, we had town hall meetings around the country to talk about this issue, about what can we do to address these shootings. And one of the, we did, one of the major problems, which we obviously knew about, but was reinforced in these meetings, was this problem of these laws that prohibit the sharing of certain kinds of information yeah. to law enforcement, but also there is a gross misunderstanding of what the law does allow to be shared. Many universities um, 
have a misunderstanding that 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 they can't share certain information about a potential threat, which they very well can change, can share. So. Uh, there is, a, a, I think, a large educational effort that's required here in terms of educating the public, educating educational institutions and other institutions about information that can be shared with, with law enforcement. And under the Manchin-Toomey Amendment, um, states would have been provided grant money to shore up their databases. And uh, much like federal funding is, is used as a carrot with states to uh, lower the BAC level on drunk driving, it would have been used to incentivize uh, states to shore up and actually share this information um, with the, uh, I believe it's the NCIC database. You know, the powerful, the power that lobbyists have over the members of the House and Senate that's just uh, in this area, NRA leaders are definite. In my mind, they're the most powerful lobbyists. And I look at the fact that 40, 50 years ago, we had a little bit of problem with kids shooting off M80s, uh, ash cans, three inches because they would sometimes destroy a mailbox or they would hurt the fingers of the kids who would shoot them. Because there was no lobbyists here in Washington on behalf of China, all that was immediately done away with. But that, to me, is where the power is, and that power is expressed in the financial support for re-election. And as I say, I'm, I am going to be writing to the leaders of the NRA and appeal to them that they can really put themselves in a good light by going back to 1900. Let me, let, let me just say something. But I, I don't want this conversation uh, to conclude with the perception of the audience that I, or maybe perhaps others, and maybe I shouldn't speak for the others, that that I I'm in it, the, that I view the NRA as the, as the enemy. I, I, um, obviously, the Second Amendment is a very important right in this country, and, and the NRA is a, is a staunch supporter of that. I agree with the father that I think in order to be successful here, I don't think I'm not sure we can defeat the NRA on this issue. What we need to do is change the minds of the members of the NRA about about why this makes sense. I think to me, that's a much more effective and much more. Uh, I'm more optimistic about that strategy than I am about defeating the NRA on this issue. Well, that's what I mean, is get the membership and right and try to be friendly with the leaders and let them know that this will be good for them and also good for the United States. And they can still sell their guns. They won't make any last profit. Okay. Great. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank thanks you. for your time. Yeah. Thanks for the yeah. And uh, we'll as always, to know you. we like to. Uh, That's always enjoyable. We like to invite folks to come in if they want to work with it. John's yeah. offered yeah. many. Because have been very generous to us about yeah. that. In fact, we have the one from Bob Pope and right. Bob right. Nash, right. So, right. who, as you said, couldn't be here today. So. Uh, yeah, I really wish Bob Pope would have been here because I think you know, given his uh, history in the as a gun show operator and a lifetime NRA member, it would have been interesting. To his perspective, but he outlined it pretty well in uh, that op-ed. And we will come back and ask for, you know, additional exposure. And then also we wanted to visit because if there's anything you all, you know, in terms of ongoing coverage or awareness of this issue, we'll just want to keep you all up to date how this thing unfolds. Because we do expect at some point this will come back up before the U.S. Senate. And between now and then, we just we want to brick by brick kind of build the case. I mean, just what real thing that you just triggered in my memory verb in this case, but um, I guess with the election year coming up, is that going to make it tougher uh, for anything to happen, you know, before this time next year? There's so many issues on the table that I, I, I don't see this as something that, unless something happens, you know, unless something happens, it's, it's I, I'm not sure that... It's uh, not my solution is just unfortunate that that's, yeah. unfo that's the way we end up talking about yeah. it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not optimistic, but that doesn't mean we should, we should discontinue talking about this. We 
you some time in between the better organized. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.